All right, there we go, everybody. We're live for our monthly Kubernetes office hours, the live stream. We're the third Wednesday of every month. We get on the internet and answer as many of your user questions as possible. All right. Um, those of you that are in the channel, if you can let us know how the stream sounds, that would really help us out. We are in hash office dash hours in the Kubernetes Slack, and we'll be popping over to hash Kubernetes dash users every once in a while to check out questions. Um, but we do have a, a slight change of plans this month. Uh, the slight invite, the Slack inviter thing is currently offline, so you can't just join our Slack and ask questions. Uh, so what we do in the description for this live stream below, we have a link to a discuss thread where you can just ask your questions there, and we'll be looking at that thread to answer it. So if you don't have access to the Kubernetes Slack, go ahead and post your question there, and we'll be monitoring. Those of you that participate, when you ask your question, at the very end, we will run a raffle and give away a Kubernetes t-shirt. That raffle is guaranteed to be random. Okay, um, I'll be your host, George Castro, and we'll begin with our panel. Before we begin, I'd like to thank uh, the companies that let their engineers um, volunteer for this. So a big shout out to Giant Swarm, StockX, Packet, Pusher.com, Pusher Red Hat, Samsung SDS, Weaveworks, VMware, Zing, Huawei, and the University of Michigan. And special thanks to Google for sponsoring the t-shirt giveaway. Okay, panel, introduce yourselves real quick. Well, I guess I'll start. Uh, my name is Bob Killen. I'm a research cloud administrator for the University of Michigan. Uh, sort of the stuff that we dive into is uh, very much Kubernetes on-prem. Uh, we also deal with things like federation, um, research workloads, uh, batch jobs. So that's more Jeff's specialty. He should be right below me in, in the Zoom window. Uh, mm -hmm. Right there, wherever, wherever. He's, he's in the Zoom window. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll uh, pass it off to him. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Sika. I also work for the University of Michigan. Um, my title is Senior Research Database Administrator, which doesn't really capture what I do. Um, but I mainly do things with running HPC and research workloads on Kubernetes. And I'm also a contributor in SIG UI and kind of SIG scheduling, but mainly for HPC and batch type workloads. Someone else, please go. Joel, you can go. Hi, I'm Joel Speed. I work for Pusher. Uh, we're a developer tools company based in uh, London. Uh, my, I'm a cloud engineer. I work mainly with Kubernetes. Been doing lots of stuff to do with uh, custom controllers and extending Kubernetes, admission controllers and stuff lately. Uh, I've also done a lot of stuff to do with authentication and authorization in the past. Uh, I go next. Uh, Priya Basi, Giant Swarm, uh, developer advocate and product owner. Uh, mainly uh, been working in, in auth and security a bit and um, also in custom controllers and custom resources. Also been looking into admission control lately <laughs> and uh, in general uh, deployments on AWS Azure and on-prem. All right. Um, I'm Ilya from VWorks. Uh, Worked on various different things in the past, including Cube Admin in the early days, and some networking stuff. Um, I'm currently mostly working on EKS Control, which is a CLI for uh, bringing up EKS clusters very easily. And uh, I've also done a bunch of work around like developer tools, like Scaffold and uh, other type of tools that that help you build containers locally and push them to wherever you want to push them and deploy. So yeah, kind of done a whole range of different things. And he's our resident um, GitOps person as well. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm George Castro, I'll be your host. I was a Heptio alum and now I'm at VMware. Um, all right, so we're gonna get started here. Let me just give you all the rundown how this is gonna work. Basically post your question into the channel. Um, this is a judgment-free zone, so everyone had to start somewhere. So if it's a simple question, that's fine. Um, we'll do our best to answer your questions, but the panel also doesn't have um, access to your cluster. So live debug debugging is kind of off topic, like we don't really know your network, um, but we'll do our best to get you moving in the right direction. Uh, panelists, you're encouraged to expand on your answers with your experiences and pro tips and all that kind of good stuff. Audience, you can help us out by pasting URLs to the official docs, blogs, or any related information. Feel free to whack it into the channel and we will um, address it. 
Uh, post your questions to the discuss thread, which I posted earlier in the channel here. You can post in the Slack channel, but there are a lot of you out there who don't have access to the Slack right now while the inviter is down. Uh, so there's the URL for that. If not, it is in the YouTube description for this live stream. Uh, so we'll be we'll be checking that out. Um, all these sessions are recorded and available on YouTube. They'll be available about an hour after this live stream. Um, if you want to sit in on this panel, we always could use more people to help um, get a little rotation going. It's like the same, just a bunch of white dudes all the time. So we definitely want to get a more diverse set of people. So it would be nice for some of these people to not have to come every single month. So if you want to pay it forward, we'd really love it. We could set up a rotation for you. The commitment is one hour a month. Um, and that's that. And we're always looking for marketing help. If you could tweet this out, uh, that would be really great. And then at the end, uh, we'll hold out a rally or a raffle for a t-shirt. So is that with that, is everybody ready? Oh, before we start, I do want to mention one more thing. There was a CVE for Run C this month um, that's posted there. Uh, everyone who's using Kubernetes in production does need to check that out. And that we did have over the past six months, we have had a few of them. So please do your due diligence as an operator and check out the CVEs. They're always posted on the blog um, and on the announce section and discuss kubernetes.io or the kubernetes-dev mailing list so please check that out and with that what's our where's our first question am i just reading from the top here okay thumbs up so awalak i hope i pronounced that right welcome says we are working on refactoring of service catalog migration from api server to crds current implementation uses field selector which is not supported on crds we have two possible solutions. Replace it with a proper indexer for a particular informer, and then they link to their POC, um, or use the label selector and decorate resources with additional labels. Um, it's redundant because you have this information under spec and also in labels, but example, Prow is using this approach. Is this solution we have additional problem with keeping consistency between labels and fields in the spec? Can you provide some guidance on which solution is better from the performance point of view, long-term support in Kubernetes, et cetera? Hmm, we're using labels for the same thing. Um, there will be at some point, I think there is work on, on making spec fields uh, selectable too, but that will take a few versions of Kubernetes. Um, what you could do and what I'm looking currently into in is uh, auto filling the labels based on the spec using uh, open policy agent, for example. It's uh, very easy to write some rego that uh, just takes a spec and uh, duplicates it there. And then you don't have any issues with the syncing because um, it's done by, by the uh, policy that you write. Personally, I would go with the indexer approach that you've uh, put been put in the POC link. Uh, it looks pretty sensible to me. It's probably the easiest way to filter. And personally, I'm not a fan of the duplicating of the spec into labels, but it's everyone's choice as to how they approach it. I am um, whacking, I'm whacking their POC URL into the into the chat now. If people... And it's it is ugly. Like the the duplication in labels, I, I kind of hate it. It's, uh, I just hope that you don't need it at some point anymore, so you can just get rid of it without implementing some stuff. Yeah, do you happen to know like the PR issue that's being discussed? No, Gotta look it up. My head. That'd be good. Does anybody else on the panel have an opinion here? I would have gone with duplicating the labels just because that's what a lot of other different projects are doing. I don't like it, but it's it's a pattern. You seem adequately whelmed at the pattern. All right. Any other comments on this one? If we find the PR, we can we can whack it in the chat there for reference. All right. Moving on. Alex, welcome. Alex says, "Is there a way to set up a job template where I loop over an array to set the args for a command?" Do you want to tackle this one, Jeff? Yeah, I don't actually think so. I, th I think like it would have to be an entry point, like some sort of entry point script. 
please someone correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think uh, you're you're correct there. Right now, it is sort of assumes like you can't pass or like individual variables to each uh, item in the you know in the job. Oh, I believe that's uh, being worked on or uh, like I forget there was like an, an index or something people wanted to pass so that information could be passed in there. Yeah, so I know there was work being done with like batch style computing and being able to pass what the index of that job running was, but it wasn't like being able to pass individual arguments on top of that. So you couldn't do like Monte Carlo just based on a like an array of values within the job template. Yeah, no, this was specifically just passing like the the index of the pod itself. So if you have like a parallel of four, they'd have like you know zero, one, two, and three. So that way you could at least do something around that. Yeah, otherwise you would maybe need to to pull the arc somewhere like out of a queue that just um, doesn't have the arc then anymore, and then the next one just takes the next if if you don't need ordered. And I think that goes back to having some sort of an entry point script in the container that'll be aware of where it is in the job queue and then pull the right arg. So unfortunately not. Okay, and that will be a good time to mention is if we answer the question and there's maybe some questions that we have for you, feel free to also just post a follow up um, or if you need some clarity or something or if we make an assumption that is incorrect, Feel free to correct uh, correct us. We have no problem going back and and teasing stuff out. I think one time we spent an entire episode answering a question, and it took us the entire episode uh, going back to it every once in a while. Matt, welcome to Office Hour. Says working with adding two iSCSI volumes to a container. I have two in my YAML config, but I'm unsure if they are mirrored to the mount point. Uh, can you explain like what do you mean by mirrored to the mount point? Matt, if you're listening, we'll just come back to you there. Uh, just type. You can just type it in line. You don't have to. You don't have to do a reply or whatever, and we'll come back to you. Simon Gottschlag, hey Simon, good to see you. Says question: Some pros and cons for running infrastructure as code with GKE. What have you tested, and what has worked good? What has worked well? Let's do that. Have any of you done uh, infrastructure and code in GKE? Yeah, look like he might have, and then he muted again quickly. <laughs> All right, let's reread the question. Yeah, some pros and cons for running infrastructure as code with GKE. What have you tested, and what has worked well? Okay, that seems like a, like a super broad question, really. Yeah. So, infrastructure as code is generally a good idea. We kind of tend to call it GitOps these days, um, you know, when it comes to Kubernetes workloads as such, right? So if you wanted to um, use something to bring up GKE clusters uh, without, you know, before you actually use like a GitOps operator to deploy things into Kubernetes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your options uh, kind of uh, somewhat limited. You, you have Terraform or... Uh, um, or gcloud CLI or uh, you could drive the API directly or you could um, uh, you could probably also use the um, uh, Google deployment manager uh, if I remember correct that was the name of it but like mm -hmm. terraform is kind of the most popular thing within the community really so that's uh, that's the kind of go-to solution for that to bring up the clusters that put themselves but after that you could install something like Works Flux, uh, which lets you point it, uh, point the cluster at the repo, and um, get all your deployments going from there. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's like a very high level overview. I don't know what people what they mean when they ask pros and cons, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's. he's I think this, there's this little, is, Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, there, so if I, I can't see anything. They generally is as an idea of of doing, uh, is it is a question of doing infrastructure as code versus doing something else? Or uh, is this, uh, are they asking for tool comparison? 
Yeah, so he says more specifically setting up the cluster, not deploying to the cluster. I've looked at Google Deployment Manager, Terraform, and Ansible, but can't figure out which way would be the best way. Put up the best way. Terraform is probably by far the most popular for that. OK. Uh, um, yeah. So Ansible, as far as uh, G Cloud APIs go, I actually, I mean, I haven't met anybody using it. I don't really know how well that gets used. I know that Ansible has a bunch of features around AWS APIs built in, and um, I've not I've not heard anyone uh, using those uh, too successfully. Right? It's kind of it's kind of limiting. Limiting Ansible is much more powerful at provisioning machines and writing files and calling out commands. Not so much talking to APIs. And Terraform is kind of your better choice. And uh, as far as uh, Google Deployment Manager is concerned. It's, uh, it's kind of a good tool, but it's uh, it's not so well documented from what I've seen. I've struggled to find much documentation around GKE. And uh, you kind of have to do a slightly weird thing when it, when it comes to actually doing things with GKE and Deployment Manager. It's uh, it's a little bit, it's it's kind of different from everything else. So Terraform is kind of like the most popular community choice for, uh, for that purpose. Yeah, I would just back up what Ilya said. Uh, I would opt for Terraform, and I agree with everything you said about Ansible too. It's much uh, better, like suited for like managing uh, machines or managing what you install and manage on machines, and not talking to APIs. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like Matt has given us more information. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start. And someone recommended I start reposting the question, so you can read it on the actual stream. Is so Matt's working with adding two iSCSI volumes to a container. I have two in my YAML config, but I'm I'm sure if they're mirrored to the mob point. So if I lose one of my storage appliances, I don't lose my data, and the pod does not go down. That was the information that so, we needed, and then a ton of ton of YAML here. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, that's sort of a system that's going to be handled by your storage appliance itself, and it will be able to handle the failover the iSCSI target. Okay. So is there is there anything on I the Kubernetes? I think you cannot side? double mount. Uh, like trying to double mount it wouldn't wouldn't work. You would kind of mess with uh, with mirroring there. Okay, uh, Matt, that should answer your question. Ed would also like to say uh, plus one to Terraform, but Matt comes back. Is there a way to mirror these? Or, uh, or you, is this... you'd pretty much have to handle that yourself, and your application would have to be aware. Just like this mount goes down and use this other one. Actually, I, I, don't, I don't know how Kubernetes would actually handle that itself. I haven't, I haven't tried. Mm. Yeah, it, it sounds like maybe you should rethink how dependent you are on that, on that mount and uh, just maybe retry with another one or like, have a list that you go through. Yeah, and then they mentioned, is there a way to mirror with LVM or Z pools? No, you're looking at like which storage provisioner you want to use, um, and like I, I don't think there isn't even a uh, LVM volume provisioner. Okay, people are still typing. If you have a follow up, uh, Matt, feel free to post it. Uh, we'll move on to Wombats. Welcome. I think I've seen you before. Uh, question, does anybody see bigger use of admission controllers to enforce company policies on devs? If so, what typical scenarios do you see? Everyone's all nodding. Okay. OPA. OPA. What, what is that? Give me a link. Open policy agent. Open policy. Yeah, I also just posted it in the thread that I mentioned before. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of developing as the standard. Uh, I think uh, the Azure team had a nice uh, admission controller based uh, implementation that is now upstream in the OPA repo. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm currently actually testing it out. It looks super nice. Uh, it's basically okay. uh, an engine that impl where you imp implement your policies in Rego, which is a language. Um, for defining yep. policies. And, awesome. Uh, yeah. it, it works pretty well, uh, but you need to like pull in data if it's about um, about kind of access and, and company policy and processes, you might need to have some data based on which you decide things. Uh, 
and there is ways to import data into the into the policies. Cool. Thanks for your question, Wombat. And that one actually came from the forum. So those of you that are just listening in on the live stream, uh, Slack invites are not working. So we've put a discuss thread in the description for this live stream. So feel free to just ask your question in there or ask it in the channel uh, and we'll go ahead and queue it up. And when we run out of questions, we'll pick random ones from Kubernetes users or discuss. Yeah. Um, this question actually came up uh, regarding like o OP and more granular stuff on uh, Discuss, and I posted an example uh, from the thread awesome. there. Awesome, awesome. And then what we'll do is we'll go back, we'll go back and post those answers there in the thread. So we have one nice. Let's just use the thread as our notes. What do you guys? What do y'all think about that? Um, all right. Anything else on OPA before we move on? All right, Zan C. Ooh, hope I got that one right. Uh, ask question. Welcome to Office Hours. Is it possible to access the evicted pod resources? One of my friends installs Jenkins and Kubernetes, but after one day that Jenkins pod gets evicted and would like to get the secrets back. And Joel, I believe you asked a follow up on what kind of secrets they were talking about. Yeah, so it looks like what they've done is installed Jenkins and then manually configured it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm guessing all those secrets end up in a nice little config file sat on the disk. Uh, and then as soon as the pod goes away, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, once, the, once the pod is evicted, there's no way to get it back. That You can't get the uh, volume either because that would be uh, garbage collected. Um, so I was just sort of suggesting in there, either use a persistent volume claim if you want to configure it by the UI and have the config stored in that, or just configure it using Kubernetes secrets and config maps is probably the better way to go. All right. Any comments on this one? I wrote notes in our HackMD that more or less mirrored what Joel said. So Excellent. Excellent. All right. Yone underscore DL. Welcome to Office Hours. As Hey, thanks for your doing. No problem. Um, is there a better way to use project in multiple environments than using Helm and its variables? I mean, for example, with config map and environment variables, it's easier to have just one values.yaml file and make sure everything in the project is based on it uh, than using a config map deployment as environments. FYI, I have 10 projects, and I can use a single big values YAML per environments with Helm to manage all my projects. I'll go ahead and repaste the text here on the stream so people can see it. Um, Rico, we'll get to your question here in a minute, and Simon as well. We're just building up a queue here, so please keep them coming. Uh, don't wait for us. Just keep ask, asking your questions. All right, this one. Um, we're starting to see more usage of like customize where you can sort of have like uh, a YAML file with all these specific things that you need to template in for that uh, explicit environment. I'm, I'm personally not a big fan of Helm, um, but it's used by uh, a good chunk of the community too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think both both can work depending on how, how you used to, to work. Uh, I think having uh, a big YAML file is customized, or a big uh, values YAML is is not a not a taboo, and it's it's actually okay to to keep all your config in, in kind of a config file, and then applying it to all the charts. Uh, this way, at least you you're keeping it central, and sometimes you might need uh, values that overlap uh, between charts that uh, similar to how how we would do it normally. Uh, mirror 100%. The only thing I'll add is, in our use cases, we keep all of our secrets in our CI pipeline, so they're not like in the values.yaml file. They're just placeholders, and they get filled in by the CI pipeline. Yeah, we we have actually a config map and a secret, and uh, those get kind of merged into a values before applied and <laughs> hacky way of doing stuff. And I will, I will try to get a home, folks. I'm just writing myself a note here. Try to get Matt Farina maybe in the afternoon session to answer some home questions. That's More Michigan cool. people? More Michigan people. We are not geographically diverse in this show, unfortunately. All right. Any other, any other comments on this templating? Or the values that you know, my bad. All right, moving on. Uh, those of you that are listening, please feel free to answer questions. We're down to seven in the queue, so keep them coming. All right, Simon asks, 
I read something about Bonsai Cloud doing an off module where you can use the same off the same off to all clusters on all providers. Have you seen, tested, or worked with it? Not sure what it does. I guess it is either a webhook authorizer or an OIDC implementation. Uh, mm -hmm. Not sure if there is any. Is there any limitations on any provider as to what to set as OIDC or webhook authorizer uh, authenticator? Because um, otherwise, I would just uh, even all zero would work as a central. Mm -hmm. I know some are restrictive of like what you can set for like your options for starting the thing up, but yeah, not yeah, sure if any uh, AKS only supports Azure AD. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know what? I'm going to see if the TGIK folks would be interested in this. Uh, he uh, linked to it in the thread. Yep, I got it. I'm going to toss hey, the it's link. It's RBAC, so let's take a look at this thing. Yeah, so I'm going to. I'm going to slap that in there, and I'm going to see if Jero wants to take a look at this because this is very interesting. Maybe this will be the year we can get a second camera so we can have two things going on the stream at the same time. Uh, I think yeah, it's in what it does. Yeah, and it's... Yeah, but it's. I think it's putting a proxy in front uh, in front of the API, and that's how it's how it's provider agnostic. Although you shouldn't really. So it's using a product called Dex on in the back end, which in mm. theory any community should be able to connect to. It's obviously dependent on whether your provider allows you to set the OIDC config or not. Um, but that does then have lots of different upstream options um, for what you can use for the auth. It's something you could build yourself by the looks of it. Not yeah, related question. Have we have we figured out what's up with Dex lately? Is that still going to be a thing? I know they were like with the Red Hat IBM mergers mm -hmm. and CoreOS and stuff. It's been spun out as okay. a yeah. project. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I actually am now a maintainer of Dex. Um, I was hey. invited to the project last, last month. Um, so it's in its own org. So Dex IDP slash Dex. Uh, and there's a team of about four of us at the moment doing the maintenance on the project. That's sweet. Um, so it will. It will survive. Awesome. Thank you yeah, for all the work. Happy it was abandoned for such a such a long time. Yeah. Also, <laughs> uh, the proxy, right? Uh, OS two proxy yep. is also good work there. That is awesome. Thanks. Simon says Dex is working quite good. Let's see if he has a follow up. He does. How are they able to get AKX AKS to connect to Dex if it's not possible to change OIDC in the API server? I think what they do is they put uh, an OAuth proxy in front of the API of AKS because mm -hmm. it's public anyway. The API they don't have private private APIs, mm -hmm. and then they they allow everything in in the API of AKS, but this allow or do the authorization in front of it. Okay. Then he mentions there's also vouch proxy. He says he likes that one as well. Looks like an option. Um. Oh, that used to be Lasso. Okay. Um, and Arjun has a follow-on question. So with Dex, I can use my AD credentials to log into the Kubernetes dashboard? Sort of. Um, <laughs> so if you're using Dex or any IDC, uh, it's not... So you, you can get the ID token, uh, which is a JOT, uh, JSON web token, and you can paste that into the Kubernetes dashboard, which then has like a a token field when you mm -hmm. see the login screen. Uh, alternatively, the OAuth2 proxy, which I also maintain, uh, <laughs> has uh, some support for doing this in Kubernetes. So you can put that in front of the dashboard. It will ensure that you're logged in uh, and then put the JOT token in a authorization header, which the Kubernetes dashboard then proxies through to the API server when you're making requests. So that way you can make sure people are logged in and you also get a bunch of uh, RBAC and stuff. Uh, in the Kubernetes dashboard. So Simon says, if that's correct, that seems really scary. Make me feel better. Yeah. What's scary? Sorry. I think the, the, the proxy dashboard. in front of the API thing. Yeah. I think that's what he meant. The proxy in front of the, dash, the dashboard, I don't think that's an issue. Um, OK. You should actually have a yes. proxy in front of all your admin. Like if you have a Prometheus or Grafana out, uh, 
put the OAuth proxy in front. Okay. All right, people are furiously typing. And while we have them here, any, any follow-up questions about DEX and OAuth, might as well just ask them and then we'll get back to them. Not that, but I will say there is a effort going on this year to actually make uh, auth more of a thing with dashboard to mm -hmm. actually delegate all auth uh, to the API server. So if you log in, essentially it proxies auth from the dashboard to the API server. So anything the API server supports, you're able to do through dashboard instead of having some third party plugin okay. or proxy in front of it. And, and Joel is whacking uh, URLs there for. Um, <laughs> for single sign-on for the dashboard experience. Shameless plug for himself. Hey, if you're volunteering your time, you get to do the shameless plug. Uh, one thing I will do, though, I'm starting to notice um, I'm going to collect all the links that we're talking about today and kind of roll them up and post them in the discuss thread so we have them. And uh, um, on the question of ADFS, I have used Dex, or the old Dex at least, uh, against ADFS uh, 3, I think, which has OIDC uh, support. That does work. Um, you just need to be uh, take care of the right certificates. If, like some some ADFS doesn't isn't set up with the right certificates, mm -hmm. and then Dex does complain. Um, yeah. And Simon says Dex doesn't support groups with ADFS. Yeah, best to use OIDC there. I think Direct AD um, doesn't have that support. But if you no. run old ADFS, that doesn't work. Uh, uh, it, Dex doesn't have support for groups in a lot of the implementations. Um, recently, we had, or there's a PR open to add Google Groups, for instance. Uh, all I would say on that is PR welcome, if you're interested. Mm. And then he's posting more information with that. Thanks to the person who PM me, saying that the stream actually had inverse colors and our Kubernetes symbol was not blue. I apologize to you all, but I have fixed that. I don't. Uh, so by default, OBS had like reverse colors. I don't understand. Okay, anything else to do with auth while we're here before we move on to Rico's question? Just because he's mentioned it, um, he's saying that the IDC provider doesn't have group support, and that was because of the way that groups are handled by Google. So we're actually farming the Google stuff onto a separate connector, and then OIDC should be able to support groups the way it should do. Uh, once Google's in its own separate connector. Okay, I'll give Simon a chance there to type if he's typing. We're a little bit over halfway done. Th those of you that are just joining us, thanks for joining us. Unfortunately, the Slack invite system is down. So if you're not already on the Kubernetes Slack, we have no way to get you in there. So if you check out the stream description below, uh, there's a link to the discuss thread where you can just post your question and we will get to it in the queue. So far, we have one question in the queue. I'm waiting for more. So feel free to do that. In the meantime, it seems like we have a lot of questions about Dex. Keep on asking them. We'll get to Rico's questions. And then why don't we loop back um, to that? So keep on asking your questions. OK, Rico asks, I've already asked a question in SIG Windows. Uh, your answer would be really helpful. Does anyone know when Calico BGP will be supported by Windows Server with Kubernetes? The official documentation says Calico BGP is not yet implemented. For that, I think you're going to have to reach out to the Calico folks. Um, yeah. They're pretty responsive in their Slack. So yeah. Also on Twitter, like just, just ping Andy or someone on Twitter and they'll answer you. Andy who? Uh, help. Help What's me out with again. That. Um, Sorry. <laughs> so does does do they have they have a channel in Slack, right? Let me check. Yeah, they should have a channel. Uh, so this isn't a Windows question. Like a Windows person wouldn't know, right? Like if you're at Microsoft, you probably don't know this. Mm. Unless you're working. It's Calico there. specific, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just figuring out. I'm I'm not aware that there has been even an alpha for Calico on Windows. Um, yeah, they definitely don't have a channel in the Kubernetes Slack. CNCMs, CNCF Slack, maybe? Let me look. So, uh, what are you looking for? Uh, just that the Calico folks have like a channel in Slack. Oh, it's it's in like they have their own Slack. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, calicos. Uh, it's slack.projectcalico.org. I will drop the link in. Find it right here. They will know. Oh, double post. But that's good to know. Um, and then someone's asking a follow-up about psyllium. Let's just get it out of the way here. Um, but I can see the smile on Bob's face. Uh, Pasuric asks, we're considering using psyllium for our clusters. We know the digital ocean is using it as well. Do you have some insight if it is used widely and maybe why yes or no? I know they just had a major release and it actually looked dope. Yeah. I'm going to find out that information while you talk, Bob. I can't I'm, speak uh, to how widely they're being used, but again, definitely plus one it for being awesome. Um, that's I, I also love anything and everything about eBPF and and that offload to the lower level part of part of the the Linux uh, subsystem. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do the, the nice thing is they also have a whole slew of integrations, and you can actually do things like network policies based on DNS names and a whole slew of other fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess most of us and uh, a lot of people are looking into it. Running it in production, I haven't seen many. Uh, DO is doing because they had BB eBPF before that also in their own infrastructure, I think. Uh, we are testing it. Um, we need some overlay on some uh, uh, on some infrastructures, and their um, Cydium doesn't come with a known overlay, or at least not with, with BGPs. So, um, I think SUSE is working on a, on a BGP BIRD implementation for Cydium. That they would do, be nice. Yeah, they do have a way of plugging into, I think it's, uh, or have a thing with Cube Router for handling BGP, and essentially it's just handling uh, like some of the rules and some of the other offload. Yeah, I haven't used Cube Router yet. Uh, would be something to test, maybe. Yep, uh, using Cube Router for BGP and Cilium. Yeah. Yep, uh, I looks... have personally not, not done that integration. Uh, we're just using vanilla Cilium because um, for our stuff, we don't have to integrate with BGP, but. Did you move to 1.4 yet or? Uh, no, we're still on 1.3. Just curious. That's a problem for next week, Bob. <laughs> All right, I hope that answers your questions. I see people typing, so keep on typing, keep on asking, and we'll move back to it. Uh, Pursue Eric, I guess, as a feature set looks promising, we'll definitely put it in a test series. Thanks for your input. Rico also says thanks for your help. You're welcome. Stick around uh, so we can do the raffle here, which Jeffrey is working on, right? That's good. All right. Moving on to the next set of questions here. So uh, this covers all the questions that we've asked in the Office Hours channel. We have a set of questions for, from Kubernetes-users but I'd like to give people who are listening to the live stream priority if possible. So feel free to, if I miss your question, start to retype it. Or if you have a follow-up, we can move back to talk about um, auth. Looks like Max guy. I think we, yeah, we went over Max guy's question. Sure. Let's, uh, where is it? I'm looking at it. Here we go. Okay. Uh, so Max guy uh, posts, let me just repost it here. Sorry, I keep forgetting how to do this. He says, some OIDC providers like GitLab don't include groups in the JWT token, but they can be fetched from the OIDC user info endpoint. Any way to solve that other than webhook auth? We use auth0 for that, because then you can like, just write some, some small script that catches it and put it, puts it in, the, in the JWT for you. Mm -hmm. um, Dex, you could build it into it, I think. Yeah. We use a key cloak to do something like that. Yeah, key cloak would, would work. I'm going to go ahead and start posting URLs here. Yeah, I had a quick double check of the OIDC provider index, and it doesn't support this yet, but it wouldn't be too difficult to add. Um, probably only like 20 lines of code, so maybe that's something that should be done. Um, there is some PRs open around adding user info stuff at the moment to DEX, but I don't think they're quite related to this. All right, looks like Max guy is typing, and then we'll move on to Simon's next question. The notes are gonna be great for this. I, I think even if you don't watch the show, just the list of URLs and stuff we talk about 
can be really handy for people. Um, Max Guy says, I did get it working with Auth0, but prefer open source solutions. We'll check out Keycloak. Thanks. Any other, any other things other than Keycloak that are open source that you might want to toss in there? First Keycloak pretty much um, our only recommendation. That's the only one I can, I can, it's the one that we personally use. That's yeah. the one I can, I can. Yeah, I've looked for other ones, but currently um, there's not big, no big alternative. I think Dex would be closest and is very lightweight and easier to extend. So mm -hmm. if, I would, if you don't shy away from writing a bit, uh, maybe just adding it to Dex. And... If you do feel like adding that, feel free to at me in the uh, PR or something. And I'll Look at that. You got a mentor it. already. <laughs> <laughs> You're interested in doing that. All right, we'll give it a second there for the stream to catch up if anybody else has, has recommendations other than Keycloak, and then we will move on. We can, let's see, let me just check the form real quick, just the one question. All right, moving on to Simon. See, you give Simon a t-shirt, now he's getting the maximum value out of the show. That's what we like to see. Anytime you come back, it's always great. Thanks for coming, Simon. He says, I've been seeing an issue in Azure, CubeSpray plus CoreOS plus Canal plus Istio, where I'm seeing an error on three different clusters at the same time, following error creating internal. And then you read the error, which is still on the screen. Good. Uh, the cluster has nothing in common um, but it happens at the same time. Only solution I found so far is to restart cube proxy or the whole cluster. Um, the only thing I found is something like this in the following, and then he posts this gist here. Um, uh, problems like, I don't know where in that stack the problem would actually yeah. be. Yeah, it, but it does might sound be. like networking somehow. Yeah. It might or be DNS. Where pops. <laughs> yep. So for sure. So if we can't figure this one out, I'm gonna ping Craig at AKS. Maybe they have an engineer they can flop on that. Um, Simon, let's try they're, they're rolling uh, their own though with Cube Spray. They're, it's not using. Uh, uh, no, they, okay. they could try another networking solution like the, the Azure CNR. Uh, v, v, what is it? Azure v, VN. Their adapter. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're the Azure native adapter. Um, uh, he needs network policy. Uh, and then Calico policy on top. That's what we run, for example. So you could. I think that's also what is now running in AKS. Um, Calico, Calico policy and Azure network. Okay, so instead of flannel and Calico, it's Azure and Calico. Yeah, or you could also Azure and Cilium if you want while yep. we add it. Kind of. Yep, and Il Ilya or mentioned that. From, yeah. yeah, that WeaveNet also has policy support. I actually have to say that's one of the cool things about Kubernetes is like you can technically have multiple CNI adapters and one run for the policy stuff and one to actually handle the networking. Yeah. So uh, do we have any general ideas of what could possibly be going on here? Honestly, not really without like... That is it just trying something else. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the thing is that it's, that it's at the same time. So mm -hmm. it, it might be something that is... Azure infrastructure specific and not yeah. implementation specific. So it might, that's why I'm, I'm saying maybe it's DNS because it seems uh, it's it's calling a private DNS uh, with sidecar injector.dcio or, or, or a public DNS. Yeah, and, and then and maybe it it's some get... issue with like NAT or whatever and uh, somehow QProxy points to the wrong place to begin with and then you restart it once it is in a better place. Yeah, QProxy does have some issues um, depending on if you're in IP tables or IPVS mode and your version of Kubernetes. Uh, if you're in IPVS, definitely update to at least 112.5 or 113.1 because uh, it deadlocks sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
And then they mentioned I've changed to accelerated networking now since last time, maybe helps if it's VXLAN related. Is there anything in the logs on Cube Proxy? Like you could turn up the debugging on it and try and see. Yeah, he's going to check the version. Um, in the meantime, feel free to ask more questions. And, uh, I mean, one other thing you could do. Um, am I muted now? I'm not muted. No, you're good. Yeah. Um, yeah, one other thing you could do is like before you restart Cube Proxy, take a look at the IP tables rules. So you, you want to kind of check out, um, you know, whether you can manually reach that address and then and see if you can manually uh, try to reach a pod, um, like the, the actual Easter um, service. Um, uh, and see if you get to the pod, and if, if the pod is responding, take a look what's in IP tables, whether the address of the pod is what that um, virtual IP is pointing at, or it's something else, and maybe compare the IP tables rules um, before and after give proxy restart. You can use uh, IP tables, of course, IPBS um, less familiar with. So I don't know how you would troubleshoot that. Hmm. It's IPBS, but I think default is still IP tables, isn't it? Yeah, and he says the, it, the IP is reachable, but DNS has issues, it seems. Uh, the IP of the service or the pod? He is typing. Both. Um, are you using Core DNS for your DNS or are you using uh, Cube DNS? OK. Uh, and the, the core DNS timeouts, they're usually around five seconds. 30 seconds shouldn't be the, co the typical core DNS issue that yeah. is out there. I, mean, I would just isolate the problem and try to debug it outside the Istio context and just generally see if, you know, networking is in the, in the same state. Like, create some services and some deployments and, and you know, run a load test and see, see if everything is working. As Before expected. adding... Istio. Yeah. 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 Yep, they're still typing. And uh, yeah. you know, going to ask him in Signature may, may help. Yeah, and it does yeah. seem to be oh, something yeah. Azure related, so maybe, maybe uh, this yeah. is channel. Because if you still have the problem without Istio, then you're kind of ruling out things, right? Especially if it's exactly at the same time in all clusters, that can't be kind of a race condition of a single component. Or so. yeah. Right. I mean, I mean this, is, this is what re what it really takes when you when you want to run, uh, set up a cluster yourself instead of using the service. All right, he's still typing. We have about 11 minutes left. So we're going to start to wrap it up. So if you have questions and you're joining us, um, look at the link in the description for the live stream and feel free to ask your question. I'm looking at them now. Um, or ask in the hash office dash hours uh, on Slack, those of you that have access to the Kubernetes Slacks. And let me just check users one more time while Simon keeps adding more information. All right. So while this is doing on, why don't we run the, um, I'll give it another 15 seconds for new questions while Simon keeps typing and then we'll run the raffle real quick. Jeff, um, you could just let me know. Actually just post in the channel, actually just announce who it is. And then we'll, we'll figure it out from there so we can clap with them. Uh, so Kekery services, three different clusters and three different VNets, but with the same ability ability zones and regions. And that looks like Bob's responding there. Yeah, Bob brings up a point, eliminating the components one by one. Um, 
Yeah, and maybe take it up with with Azure support. They're they're usually very uh, yeah active and uh, help out. All right. So the winner of our raffle is. Hold on, I'm scrolling up to see if they're here. Is Alex? Which asked which question did Alex ask? I think it was the first one. The very it first. One. It was first or second one. Second one about the job template. Yeah. Ooh, the job template. Alex, are you on? You have to. You have to be on to claim your prize. Uh, he posted it the other day. It was before like office hours started. Okay. All right. That's fine. Not. We. I'll. I'll PM him, and if not, then we'll give away an extra shirt next week. How does that sound for everybody? All right. Last call for questions, everybody. While while we're waiting for questions here. Let me just do a quick shout out to everybody. Is there anything else the panel would like to talk about? Ilya, you look tired. What time is it over there? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> uh, it's not very late in the afternoon. It's uh, it's only like you know ten to three. It's just been uh. one. I mean, I woke up early today for some reason. Yeah, it's it's February in London. Kind of look to your face. <laughs> it is also cold here. All right. While we wrap it up, again, I'd like to thank the following companies for supporting the community with these developer volunteers. Uh, Giant Swarm, StockX, Packets, Pusher.com, Red Hat, Samsung SDS, Weaveworks, VMware, Zing, Huawei, and the University of Michigan. Um, and special thanks to Google always for sponsoring the t-shirt giveaway. We have one more question from Long that says, this example is not working. And it's the example, the rewrite example um, on kubernetes.github.io. What is this? I would maybe ping uh, Manuel, uh, who's the maintainer. OK. Um, yeah. A lot of times, the, the examples will honestly fall out of date with how rapidly yeah. things move. Especially because I think I, I do remember a time where all the examples were moved uh, twice between yeah. repos, and some of them are just way, way, way too old. <laughs> do Do you um, have their? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll check the uh, GitHub handle or Alet, Alet. or ideally a place just... where them to file an issue that isn't just pinging a developer directly. I was just going to say, make sure you're on the latest version because they changed the whole rewrite thing in the latest version that was released a couple of weeks ago. Um, okay. And that documentation is up to date with the latest version. I was mm. also fighting this a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah, that might So be. if you're two weeks off, that's why it's broken. And I, I, I pinged off. Manuel uh, in our channel. In our okay. Service. Awesome. Great. All right, Alex, I will follow up with you for your t shirt. Any last questions going once, going twice? We do have another one of these coming up in six-ish hours or so. Uh, see the topic in office hours and watch this channel on YouTube when we'll go live again. And with that, thank you, panel. Any last-minute things? Are we all waving? Let's just all wave. All right, so thanks, everybody. We'll be back in a few hours. And thank you again for joining. Thanks, everyone.